Thank you. Um, so I'll talk right now about some recent developments in understanding the limiting behavior of multiple ergodic averages that involve commuting transformations with polynomial iterates. And uh, before jumping into the talk, uh, let me maybe make two some two general points. Um, so first, whereas the previous talks focused on understanding this broad phenomenon called joint ergodicity, um, here I'll try to give some structural characterization of these averages, but by making as few assumptions on the system involved as possible. And um, second, well, we're in a conference on nilpotent structures, but one of the big points behind this result is that to obtain a lot of very general statements, we can in fact use the new potent part of the structure theory as little as possible. And we can obtain quite a lot of nice results just by using the lower level cubic structure of the, the whole square seminorms and the corresponding factors. And I hope I'll give you some a sense of how this works in the stock. And this is all based on joint work with Nikos Verzikinakis. Uh, so here is the setup. So we will look at, we'll study the L2 limits of, of these averages. Here we're taking some standard probability space and some transformations on this space, which preserve measure. Uh, we'll also want them to be invertible because sometimes we'll need to consider negative iterates of these transformations. And lastly, and importantly, all the transformations throughout the stock are assumed to commute, like it was the case in the previous three talks. And uh, I'll collectively refer to this, this, this whole data as a system without adding any extra adjectives there. Um, all the iterates throughout the stock will be polynomials. These will be polynomials with integer coefficients and with zero constant terms. I will not reiterate this assumption later, but I will assume throughout the talk that the, the polynomials have zero constant terms. These are some assumptions, of course, not necessary in the strength, but it makes the discussion much easier. And I'll refer to polynomial satisfying these two conditions as simply integral. And lastly, all the functions that you'll see on these slides will be bounded in the L infinity norm. In fact, for the sake of simplicity, you can assume that they're bounded by one in the L infinity norm. We can always make this assumption by a simple scaling argument. Um, so, so the first question, of course, is why do we even care? Why do we study the limiting behavior of such averages? And the motivation, of course, comes from the polynomial summary theorem of Bergelson and Leibman, a special case of which is stated on this slide. So let's take a system and let's take a collection of integral polynomials. Then this special case of the theorem states that for each set A of positive measure, the following intersections have a positive measure on average in the sense given by the expression on the slide. Yes, that's why I stated on the previous slide that I make this assumption throughout this talk without stating this explicitly. Because every time I'm giving this talk, someone doesn't listen and points out that I should make this assumption. So that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing this now. Every polynomial here will have zero constant term. And <laughs> once this is said for the third or fourth time, uh, let me move on to the combinatorial com corollary, which is, which is why this result is of interest. And the combinatorial corollary says that if we take integral polynomials with this assumption, and if we take any collection of integer of, of, of direction vectors in ZD, then each dense subset of ZD contains a polynomial progression of the following form for some non-zero element N. So to make this abstract statement a bit more palatable, here is a, a very, very simple example. Um, so it says that each dense subset of Z squared contains the following triple of points where we have some point X1, X2. Then we have the second point shifted by N in the first coordinate. And the third point is shifted by N squared in the second corner, coordinate. 
So this corresponds in, 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 in the statement to the polynomials n and n squared and to the vectors v1 and v2 being the coordinate vectors in the horizontal and the vertical direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so dense means a subset of positive upper density. It, it, it's of course, it can be made weaker, which I'll maybe write what it is. So it's, it means that the following limb soup is positive. So dense roughly means that the set contains a positive proportion of natural numbers in the following sense. Okay, and this is of and this is not the strongest possible version. This can be made the, the statement can be made uh, much stronger. Um, so polynomial summary theorem motivates why these averages are interesting, but at least in the original form, it doesn't give convergence. So in this statement, note that we have a limit of an average rather than a proper limit. Uh, we do know, though, that the limit exists, and this is a special case of a very, very general result of Walsh, which, which states the following, that if we take a system, a collection of integral polynomials, and any collection of bounded functions, then the following limit converges in L2. And of course, once we know the limit, the next question to ask is, what can we say about the limit? Can we somehow characterize the, the structure of this limit? And this is the question with which we will be preoccupied for the rest of this talk. Um, so there are various special cases of this question. One of them has already been discussed broadly in, in this, in, 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 during this morning. And this is when uh, are the polynomials jointly ergodic for the system in the sense that the following average converges in L2 to the product of integrals of the individual functions. So this topic has already been dis discussed very broadly by the previous speakers. I'll focus on, on something much more general. So in general, in, in ergodic theory, when we want to, when we try to characterize the structure of a limit, there are two, um, two very intertwined approaches that we can take. Um, the first one is that we can take a factor, we can try to look for a factor, meaning a T invariant sigma algebra of the original system with the property that the limit goes to zero whenever any of the, at least one of the functions is orthogonal to this factor in the, in the following sense. Alternatively, we can look for a seminorm which controls the, the limiting behavior of this average in the same sense that the limit goes to zero if any of the functions has a vanishing seminorm. And if this, if this happens, we, we do say that either the factor or the seminorm controls the average. We also say that the factor is characteristic for this average. And let me note here that the factor or the, or the seminorm that we choose may depend on the index. And in general, especially when we deal with commuting transformations, it will. So, so for a, a different index from one to K, we will have different factors or different seminorms that control the limiting behavior of this average. Um, the, the factor approach has a long history. It dates back to, to Furstenberg's multiple recurrence result. And as I said, these, these two approaches are very intertwined, although there are some differences. So the, the factor approach is more dyna dynamical. It tells us something about the structure of the system. Um, the, the same norm approach is more analytic, uh, but they are connected in a way that I'll explain in a moment. Um, so let me give you a, a, a crash course on the Hosgra structure theory. Um, so in their seminal paper from almost 20 years ago, Host and Krat defined the family of seminars which since then have proved immensely useful for studying this kind of questions. This is a family of seminorms, which depends on the system and it's indexed by natural numbers. And originally it was introduced because of, of the following property that it satisfies. Namely for, for any collection of functions which are bounded by one in the L infinity norm, the L2 limit of, uh, of, of this average is controlled from above by some absolute constant depending only on the length of, of the average and the L2 norm, the, sorry, the, the, the degree L post seminorm of any of the functions involved in the average. And uh, in particular, this implies that the limit goes to zero whenever at least one of the functions has a vanishing seminorm of degree L 
and, and in this sense, this result which shows that the whole square same norms quantitatively control these, these uh, linear averages. Uh, and uh, since then, they have been used to control many other expressions. So, so for instance, um, if we have pairwise distinct integral polynomials, then we, we can also use whole square same norms to, to control the relevant averages with a single transformation. Uh, in the sense that there exists some S, which depends only on the polynomials, and in fact, it depends on, on much less than, than just the polynomials, um, such that the, the average goes to zero in L2, um, whenever um, at least one of the functions has a vanishing whole square seminar of degree s. These whole square seminars satisfy a lot of very nice properties, which, which partly accounts for their utility in, in, in handling ergodic problems. One of them is the monotonicity property, which means that, that for every function, low degree seminars are bounded from above by high degree seminars. And this also shows that being able to control a certain average by a low degree seminar, such as the degree one or degree two seminars, is in general a much harder task than controlling it by some high degree seminar. These Hosskraft seminars are also naturally associated with a certain family of factors. Um, so there exist factors, which I'll denote this way, such that a function f has a vanishing degree s seminar, even only if it's orthogonal to the factor of degree s minus one. And these factors satisfy a lot of nice properties. Um, so for instance, the factor z0 is simply the invariant factor. So in particular, if the transformation t is ergodic, then the projection of f onto the z0 factor is just the integral of f, so it's a constant. If t is ergodic, then the z1 factor is the Kronecker factor of the system. So this is the smallest factor with respect to which eigenfunctions of the system are measurable. Um, and for higher s, we unfortunately do not have such an explicit description. However, we do know that the zs factor in general is an inverse limit of certain algebraically structured systems called s step new systems. And this deep result is the content of the famous Hoskra structure theorem. And uh, before I'll jump into the results, let me introduce one more factor, which is very relevant for polynomials. And this is the so-called rational Kronecker factor. So the rational Kronecker factor is the factor of the system, which is generated by all sets that are invariant under some power of the transformation T. In other words, this is the join of the factors. This is the join of the invariant factors of T, T squared, T cubed, and higher powers of T. Um, so let's, let me give some examples to, to illustrate how this factor behaves in two extreme cases. Um, so first, if I take an irrational rotation of the torus, then up to null sets, the rational Kronecker factor is the same as the invariant factor, which in turn is the same as the trivial factor of the system. And hence the projection of any function onto any of these two factors is simply the integral of f. By contrast, if I take a, a periodic system, such as a rotation on n elements, then t is ergodic, but t to the power of n is the identity map. So in particular here, the identity, the, the invariant factor is the trivial factor, but the rational Kronecker factor is the full power set of the system. So by projecting f onto the rational Kronecker, we do not gain or we, 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 we do not gain any change. Whereas if we project f onto the invariant factor, we again obtain the integral of f. So in this hierarchy of factors, the rational Kronecker factor is somewhere between the z0 factor, which to remind you is the invariant factor, and between the z1 factor, which for ergodic transformations is the full Kronecker factor. Um, so let me now give you a, a sense of how these factors are useful in ergodic theory. So if T is totally ergodic, then meaning that not only T is ergodic, but every positive power of T is ergodic, then these averages are known to converge to the integral of F in L2. Um, but for general T, we can't do this. And, and for general T, the invariant factor in particular will not be characteristic. All we can say for general T is that the rational Kronecker factor is characteristic. 
And this is because every polynomial, which is different from n or an translate of n, has so-called local obstructions, meaning that it does not equidistribute modulo all the primes. And because of these local obstructions, we have to take the rational Kronecker factor here rather than the invariant factor. This the statement that the rational Kronecker factor corresponds to, uh, controls the polynomial averages also has a natural analog on the combinatorial side for, for those of you who, who are more who have a more combinatorial mindset. So on the combinatorial side, the natural analog of this expression would be a counting operator of the following form. Um, and uh, here the functions are, are, are one bounded and let's assume that they're compactly supported. Um, so in the additive combinatorics, we often want to, um, to, to, to bound this expression to, to, to get some structural information on this expression. And in particular, if this expression is large in, in a vague sense that I'll not define, then we know by, by some fairly elementary arguments that F1 has a large average on arithmetic progressions of small common difference and an appropriate length. And um, the, the rational Kronecker part corresponds to the fact that, it's, that it has large average on arithmetic progressions rather than on intervals of integers. And basically the larger the expression here, the smaller the common difference of these arithmetic progressions. That's the, the connection sort of. Um, so having discussed this simple example, let me briefly summarize what we know for multiperiodic averages of a single transformation. A lot is known in this case. Uh, perhaps the, 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 the most basic result is that these averages are controlled, are always controlled by ho some Hosskraut seminorm. And this is, I think, due to Hosskraut. Um, the next very nice result here is that if polynomials are linearly independent, then the rational Kronecker factor still controls the average. And this has been proved by Fredrik Kinakis and Kram. And there are many more results on these averages. I'm, I'm just stating a few here uh, because there are just too many of them. One could easily give an entire talk, which would be a survey of these averages. So for instance, if the polynomials are quadratically independent in an appropriate sense, then accordingly, the Kronecker factor will be characteristic. And, um, and there is also an old result of Bergelson that precedes pretty much all of this, which says that if the transformation T is weakly mixing, then no matter what polynomials we have, as long as they're distinct and integral, then the average converges to the integral, the product of integrals of the function. And this is a, a very special case of this joint ergodicity phenomena, phenomenon that has been discussed so extensively this morning. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'll summarize the results that Nikos and I have proved on the topic. And I'll try to give a sense of how some of these results are proved. Um, I'll first give a very brief summary and then I'll expand on, on some of these statements listed here. Um, so for general commuting transformations and integral polynomials, we, we do examine the following L2 limits and we prove among other things, the following statement. Um, so first we give some limiting formulas in the case when the polynomials are linearly independent or in the case when, sorry, should be T1 through TK here, when the transformations are weakly mixing. From this, by some very standard arguments, we can obtain some lower bounds for the multiple recurrence of these statements. Um, in order to be able to prove all of this, we start by obtaining, by, by, by obtaining a, a control of these averages by host cross seminorms. And, and this we are able to do in most cases of interest. And uh, from, from this, we, we also obtain a so-called nil plus null decomposition for multi-coloration sequences, meaning that, we, that given a multi-coloration sequence associated with its average, we can decompose it as a sum of a nil sequence of some bounded step and a sequence which goes to zero in uniform density, so-called null sequence. So let me start with the first of these results, namely in the result where we have linearly independent polynomials. Um, so we have two statements here. First, if the transformations are totally ergodic, then we are able to prove that the average does converge to the product of integrals. And uh, second, for general commuting transformations, we know that the, we, we show that the rational Kronecker factors control or, or are characteristic for this average. And this result has been widely expected to hold, but, it, but only some very few special cases of this were known. 
So for instance, part one has been known before, but only for distinct degree polynomials. This has been due to truth, Radzikinakis and Hoss. They also had some partial results towards two, but they haven't been able to prove two for in, in the case of distinct degree polynomials uh, in, in the generality stated here. And um, as long as the polynomials were not distinct degrees, then pretty much nothing was known until a few years ago. And, and this case was wide open and, and structural results like this were not even known for this very simple example where we have a double average along two quadratic linearly independent polynomials. Um, and from this result, we, we get a corollary which gives us lower bounds on the, on the multiple recurrence. So we show that if we take any linearly independent integral polynomials and any, um, any measurable set and any positive epsilon, then the following intersection has the, ha, satisfies the following bound. Uh, for this should be reminiscent of what Ethan was talking about. This is the same kind of optimal bound that we're hoping for. Uh, so we're showing that this holds for a synthetic set of values of n. Synthetic means that the set of n for which this holds has bounded gaps. And from this, likewise, we're able to conclude that for every subset of ZD and uh, every choice of directions in ZD and every epsilon, the following intersections now have, the, have an upper density which satisfies this optimal lower bound. And again, this holds for a synthetic set of the values of n. Um, so let me now give, let me now state the two main proof components that went into proving these results. Um, so the first property that, that we use, and this is a property that is very special for the linearly independent polynomials, is that if we take any alphas in R such that not all of them are rational and any linearly independent integral polynomials P1 through PK, then the following polynomial also has an irrational coefficient. And in particular, it's in equidistributed in the torus by the classical uh, vial equidistribution theorem. So in particular, also, we know that the we, we get the following exponential sum estimates. And this is the exponential uh, sum estimate that naturally appears in our work. And secondly, we are able to obtain some seminorms for these limits. So we are able to control these limits by, by Hochschild seminorms in a generality that I'll discuss in the next few slides. And the second result, the second result holds not just for linearly independent polynomials, but in fact, it holds for any collection of pairwise linearly independent polynomials. Uh, so let me let me focus now on this second part. Um, and, and this is this is the result that we have. So if, if we take pairwise any collection of pairwise linearly independent polynomials, then there exists some S which depends on these polynomials, such that for every system, the 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 this average is controlled by a degree S seminorm of the, the functions involved with respect to, of course, the relevant transformation. In the sense that this average will go to zero in L2 whenever any of the Fi's has a vanishing degree S seminorm with respect to the transformation Ti that acts on it. And, uh, and previously, this result was only known for distinct degree polynomials. This has, it has been proved in this work of Chuf, Radzikinakis, and Hoss that I mentioned before. Um, but the existing methods were completely incapable of extending this even to the following simple case. So even to, 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 to the case of double average where we have two polynomials of the same degree. So one of the main advances in, in our, our paper came, prov came from proving this result. Once we were able to prove it, we were able to get a, so all sorts of nice results about, about these averages. Um, so one very nice corollary is, is, is this. So if we take, again, pairwise linearly independent polynomials, and if we take any collection of weakly mixing transformations, then the averages go converge to the product of integrals. And this extends, uh, uh, and the, the old result of Bergelson that I mentioned on, on a few slides ago. And the reason why this follows from our result is because if the transformation T is ergodic, then all Holzcraft seminorms become trivial in the sense that for every S, the degree S seminorm is just the absolute value of the integral of F. So using this and the Holzcraft and, and the seminorm control presented on the previous slide and the simple telescoping identity, we were able to obtain the following nice generalization of, of Bergelson's result for single transformation. Yeah.
generalization of a special case of your result. Generalization in one direction that we can in, in the other. But actually, so when they're not pairwise linearly independent, then you have to assume some, some conditions on the compositions of the transformations, and then this will still hold. And this, this is a consequence of our main result from the second paper that we have, except that these conditions are a bit complicated to state, so I, I only stated this simpler version, which, which I think can be conveyed fairly easily on, on a slide without giving too much. But here is the... Uh, here is a, a, a small side slide, let's say. Um, so on the previous slide, I said that we were able to tackle averages which have uh, pairwise independent uh, iterates. But uh, in our second paper, we actually worked out also the averages which have the same polynomials, such as here. Um, so one question that one can ask about these averages is when are these controlled by, by host class seminars? And uh, there are some natural assumptions that one can assume, that one has to assume for this to be the case. So for instance, um, if there is a function which is invariant under T1, T2, then using a similar argument to the one presented by Wenborn during his presentation, one can show that this thing will not in general be controlled by a host class seminar. But in, in our second paper, we are able to show that, that, that this condition is not only necessary, but it's also sufficient. So assuming that all the invariant functions under the composition are those functions which are simultaneously invariant under both T1 and T2, uh, we are able to also to obtain same norm control for averages of this form where the polynomials are the same or, or pairwise dependent. So we tackle this case as well. It's just that this case is much, much more complicated to state. So, so I restricted um, the presentation to the simpler case from, from the second slide. That's so. For instance, in the work of uh, Wenbo, Andreas, Andre, and Sebastian, they they also deal with such averages, but they also have a condition which which would involve the composition of T one inverse T three and T two inverse T three. We are able to get rid of these conditions at all. So we are, we are able to give such ergodistic conditions only on on these transformations where the polynomials are exactly the same. Yeah, and, and this is yeah, an improvement of, of sort of, of the earlier things. Um, and okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'll try to give you a sense of how these results are proved. Um, and specifically, I'll focus on this very simple example, which as I said before, we knew nothing about or almost nothing, except for some partial results of, of, of Wenbo, Andrea, uh, Andrea and Sebastian, which, which I'll state uh, shortly. So, so let's assume we are dealing with this average and let's assume that T and S are totally ergodic and that they commute. And I'll try to sh convince you that this identity holds. So the proof, yeah. No, each of them is totally ergodic separately. Yeah, not the group, yeah. Um, so the first thing that one needs here Okay, maybe before that, um, the usual approach to do this would be just to run the pet and try to obtain the same norm control just by running the pet for, for this average. But the problem is that the averages, that, that the same norms that one obtain in this way are rather ugly. And in fact, one can only control the L2 norm of this average by an average of certain box seminorms, which uh, depend on TS, but, but, but look quite complicated. When Bo gave an example of this on his slide, and if you remember, what he did then, then this shows the level of complexity that one has to deal with. So, so one of the very nice results of, of, of Wenbo, Andreu, Andre and Sebastian was, Andreas, not Andre, sorry, and Sebastian was to upgrade this ugly result obtained from PET into obtaining a proper, into, into controlling this, this, this average by a single box seminar, 
which involved only two principal directions kind of. So it only involved S and T inverse S. Um, so this was sufficient for obtaining nice joint ergodicity results that the guys have discussed. However, this has not been sufficient for proving some more general structural results on averages like this. And in order to do so, we upgraded this result into controlling this average by a proper host cross seminorm. So not just a box seminorm, but a proper host cross seminorm. And this is one of the main ingredients of, of, of our paper. And then we used a variant of the degree lowering argument um, to pass from controlling this average by an arbitrary host cross seminorm into the host cross seminorm of the right direction. So a degree lowering argument is a technique introduced by Sarah Peluz in her finite field works on the polynomial samurai. Then it has been adapted to, to, to the polynomial samurai works over the integers by herself and Sean Prendeville. Um, then Nikos has adapted it to the ergodic theory setting. And since then it has found numerous applications in, in a lot of different problems. Um, here, the argument that we're using is a, is a yet more complicated version of the argument that Nikos provided in, in, in his first paper on joint ergolicity. And the reason for this is that we are dealing with several transformations at the time. And, and this causes a lot of extra difficulties that are not present while doing degree lowering for a single transformation. So the degree lowering that we provide here is also new, and it caused us quite a lot of pain to prove it. But uh, the result that we got in the process is very general and has allowed us to prove very nice statements like this one. I'll not focus though on giving the details of the degree lowering. If you're interested, then the, the paper by Nikos on joint ergodicity has a very nice exposition with an example. I'll focus instead on, on part two, uh, which is a completely new thing and, 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 and for, for which we had to introduce an entirely new argument. Um, before I do this, let me make sure that we all understand what definitions are there. So you've seen probably definitions of the host cross seminorms, by host, but host cross seminorms can be generalized to so-called box seminorms, which also appeared in the previous three talks. So in the very simple case where we have two transformations TS, the box seminorm associated with these transformations is given by, by this expression. So you can think of this as an average over the following cubes, where in one direction, the, the cube goes by transformation T, and in the other direction, it goes by the transformation S. And we can similarly extend this definition for, for higher degree seminorms in a more or less obvious way. Um, so this is the result of, of uh, Wenvo, Andreu, Andras, and, uh, and, and Sebastian that, uh, that I mentioned earlier. So they showed that if we have this average, we can control it by a seminorm of the following form. So, so this uh, seminorm involves two transformations, S and T inverse S. The reason why S appears there is sort of obvious, S is the transformation that acts on G. The reason why T inverse S appears is maybe less obvious, but when you do PET, you have to compose this, compose this average with something like T inverse N squared. And then the transformation that acts on G, its, its highest degree polynomial corresponds to the transformation T inverse S. So this is why, why these compositions also appear here. And our input, as I said before, is to show that in fact, we can find S, small s, such that the following proper, where are we? The following proper host cross seminorm controls this average. And we do this via a new technique, which we call seminorm smoothing, and, and which I'll introduce shortly. And, and as I said, the stronger seminorm control is necessary for the degree lowering argument. At least up to now, we don't know how to use just the box seminorm in order to perform degree lowering efficiently. So, okay, how does this argument work? So we will now play some ping pong here uh, because the argument goes by a two-step strategy which resembles ping pong a bit. So what we do here is we pass information from function G to F and then back from F to G in a similar way that we would pass a ping pong ball from one end of the table to the other. Um, so suppose for simplicity that we that this seminorm controls the average in the sense that this thing goes to zero whenever this seminorm is zero. Now, in the first step of the argument, we use this control in order to show that this kind of seminorm controls the average. So in this sense, we pass information from G to F. And in the second step, we use this kind of auxiliary control 
to show that this seminorm controls the original average. This is a relatively simple setting. The argument becomes more, much, much more complicated when this seminorm has higher degree and also involves S. However, in the simple case, the, the simple case already um, shows a lot of the intricacies or a lot of the tricks that, that, that we have to use. So let's look at thing. Uh, I'll, I'll do this by contrapositive. So I'll show that if this limit is positive in the L2 norm, then the, an appropriate seminorm of F is positive. So let H be, be the limit here and let G be the following function. So um, it's an average of certain product and this function is constructed in such a way that if you rewrite this, the square of this L2 norm as an inner product, then it can be rephrased as the correlation of g of small g with the structure function big G. And now by using the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, we can bound this by the L2 norm of big G. And now again, rewriting this as an inner product and using the, 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 the definition of big G, we can rewrite this as the following integral. And performing Cauchy-Schwarz at this point, we can remove H and we can show that the following L2 norm is positive. The important thing here is that we passed from the original average where we had arbitrary functions f and small g, and we passed to the following average where the, the arbitrary small g has been replaced by this very structured big G, which can be expressed as an average. And it's the structure of the big G, which we will use, we, which we have used both in this passing and which we will use in the next uh, steps. So recall the assumption. We're assuming that this goes to zero whenever this goes to zero. Or, or equivalently that if this is positive, then this is positive. And we assume that this holds for all functions G. So in particular, we can use this with the function big G. So we showed in the previous slide that if this L2 norm is positive, then this L2 norm is also positive. So by using now this assumption, this gives us that the following seminorm of the big G function is positive. And now at this point, we use the inverse theorem for degree one seminorm. So we know that the degree one seminorm can be expressed as a correlation of big G with some function, which is invariant under this, this composition. In fact, we can give a very explicit description what, what this function U is. So U is here the conditional expectation of, 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 of big G onto the invariant factor with respect to this function. But this doesn't matter. What matters is this invariance property. So in particular, what it gives us is that S times U, S acting on U is the same as T acting on U. And let's now see how we use this property. So using this fact and using again, the fact that the function G has this nice structured form, we are able to show that um, we're, we're able to bound this expression after an application of Cauchy's facts by the following thing, by the following L2 norm, where here, Again, notice, and initially we had here the small g, then we passed to having big G here, the structure function, and now we pass to having this invariant function here. And because the function u is invariant under this transformation, we can replace s u by t u. So we end up with an average which involves only a single transformation. And this is the major simplification. This is the simplification because we know very well how to handle averages which involve only a single transformation. So using no results for single transformation, we know that we, we get that some degree, some, some T seminorm of the function F is non-zero. We also get from this that some T seminorm of U is non-zero. However, U is not the original function. So this result doesn't really tell us that much here. So this is the pink step. This is how we pass from having a control by G to some control by F. In the pong step, we would, we would argue similarly. Um, so in the POC step, we, we would similarly reduce to averages of this form, where now we would replace F by a, by a dual function of F of degree of some degree S, which is associated with, with this transformation. And these functions are also very structured. We know how to deal with them. In particular, after applying van der Korp finitely many times, we can, we can completely get rid of this from the average. So when you see an average like this, Really, you should think of this as a single average twisted by some term, which can be easily disposed of. And because of this, we can control this average by some seminorm of G. 
Um, so for longer averages, the argument goes more or less similarly, but the induction becomes quite quite more complicated. So let, let's let me give you a, a brief idea of what happens if we have three commuting transformations, T, S, R, R. Um, so the most complicated averages here are those which involve different transformations at each step. The least complicated and those that we know how to understand by previous works are those that involved only the same transformation everywhere. And, and the induction here goes at gradually passing from one of them to the other. So starting from an average like this, in the, punk, in the pink step, we would reduce this to an average which has T, S, and S. And then after one more iteration, we would reduce it to an average which has S in all place. And this we know how to handle. Uh, so this is how the induction goes for the pink step. For the punk step, we gradually replace all the other functions by, by an appropriate dual functions. So what we end up in, at the average is with a single average involving only this, only this thing, which is twisted by a product, product of dual functions. And dual functions, we know we can get rid of using van der Um, So this is all for ergodic theory. At the very end, let me very briefly comment on how these techniques can be adapted to, to the combinatorial setting. Um, so in a separate work, I, I used these techniques to obtain bounds in a certain finite field version of the multidimensional polynomial summary theorem. Namely, I showed that if we take linearly independent integral polynomials, and if we take some direction vectors in ZT, then each subset of, of Zn of, of the cyclic group to the power of D, where N is prime, or equivalently each subset of, um, of, of, of a finite field of, of uh, dimension D, which lacks a polynomial progression of this form, has at most that many elements. So this is a very strong bound. It bound it's a, it's a power-saving bound. Um, and, and this result jointly generalizes an earlier result of Pelous, uh, which, which handled the case where we have only one dimension, and the result of myself, where, which handled the case where the polynomials were distinct degrees. So this result uses everything, pretty not everything, but it uses most of these new advances that Nikos and I have developed in ergodic theory, it also uses a few, a few new things. So for instance, it uses a quantitative concatenation result for certain box seminorms, which is of independent interest. This is, however, a different story. I'll stop here. And uh, thank you very much for attending this morning's session. The power saving comes from the fact that if you take the exponential sum estimates uh, over finite fields um, of the form that I stated earlier, then you can show that these alphas are either zero or when, they, when they're not zero, then the average satisfies uh, an appropriate power saving like this. Uh, so that's why there is power saving. And also in pretty much all the other arguments, you just run van der Korput and 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 uh, pigeonhole principle. So all the losses that you're gaining at each time are only polynomial, and and somehow combining these things, uh, the the error that you get is is of this form, um, and and that's why you get this power saving. We haven't tried it. <laughs> <laughs>